Hey church family, thanks for joining us in Edgewood, Wellspawn, and online as we walk through our current sermon series, Faithful. To stay up to date with what's going on in the life of our church, make sure to check us out on our Facebook page, Stone Point News, or our website at stonepointchurch.com. And one more thing, next weekend will be July 4th, and we will not be having regular Sunday services, so we encourage you to spend this time with your family. Today is the last day for the early bird sign-up for Kids Camp at $3.29 per person. Go online to register at stonepointchurch.com forward slash events. It feels like summer break just started, but we are already looking ahead to school starting back in the fall. Over the next month, we will be collecting school supplies for both the Wills Point and Edgewood school districts. It is a great way to get involved and serve our community. We are collecting 12 count boxes of number two pencils and boxes of tissue. Our goal is to collect 1,200 boxes of pencils and 800 tissue boxes. You can bring school supplies to either campus on Sunday morning or to the office in Wills Point during the week. The deadline to bring school supplies is Sunday, July 25th. Baptism is a huge step of faith and is an outward display of an inward decision made to follow Christ. We are excited to share in this experience with several of our brothers and sisters in Christ as they take that step of faith and are baptized. Our next baptism celebration will be Sunday, August 8th at Splash Kingdom from 6 to 9 p.m. If you are interested in being baptized, write it on a communication card or contact us at pastoraloffice at stonepointchurch.com. We would love to meet with you and talk more about baptism. Well, good morning, church. How is everybody? We're doing well. You're good. All right. Well, glad that you're here. My name is Cody King, and I'm on staff here and just want to say welcome. Um, And real quick, um, if you are part of the body and you've been here, you know what this is. Uh, If you would grab one from a a seat nearby and uh, fill this out for us, give us a little information about yourself, first-time guest, we ask you to do the same. Just grab a communication card, give us a little information. If you turn it over on the back, you'll find an area for prayer requests. So if there's anything that you need prayer over, please take a few moments and let us know what that is so that we can be praying and interceding for you. Also, if there's anything praiseworthy, let us know what the Lord's been doing in your life so we can celebrate alongside you. Um, So if you would do that for us, um, first time guests, if you would take this through the doors here to your right. After the service, we'd love to meet with you in our connection point on the other side of this wall. Um, answer any questions that you may have. We'd love to pray for you if you need prayer. Um, And we'd also like to give you a free gift just to say thanks for spending some time with us this morning. Uh, And we're really glad that you're here, and we pray that you're blessed this morning. And one thing from the video that I want to remind us of and reiterate is next week on July 4th, we will not have services on either campus. Uh, Please take that time just to uh, spend the morning with your family if you're on vacation Uh, enjoy that time as you're on vacation and uh, celebrate Independence Day well um, as uh, we won't be gathering here next week. Okay, so I'm going to pray for us and we're going to continue to worship. Lord, I thank you for this morning and our time together. Um, Lord, I thank you for the opportunity, the privilege, Lord, to gather as we do corporately, Lord, to, um, to fellowship with one another, to encourage one another, to greet one another. Um, Lord, and I pray for our time now that um, we join with one another, Lord, in worshiping and praising you um, together. Uh, Lord, I pray that we lift you up, Lord. Lord, that you are glorified in us this morning, that you position our hearts and our minds before you, Lord, to, um, to be blessed by your faithfulness, Lord, as we... We continue, Lord, to learn this morning of what it looks like to be faithful to you in light of your faithfulness to us. Lord, we love you and we thank you. And it is in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Will you stand with us? Let's continue to sing and worship a faithful, good God. Let's declare the truth as the body of Christ together.
what dream has he put in you? What's living in here, huh? lately have struggled with just praying very vague and general prayers like you know that a, uh, I don't know that there's really any big answer when you just pray something very safe maybe I'm alone maybe no one else knows what I'm talking about but I think that is from the enemy. I just wanna remind you and I wanna remind myself that the resurrection power of Christ lives also in me because of him, because of what he's done. The Lord wants nothing more than to bring heaven here on earth and he does it because he partners with us. And the only way that happens is when we speak it out, when we declare it, when we carry the authority that we already have given to us by him, it comes through him. And it comes out when we pray it. And I think there's nothing more than the enemy he just wants to steal that from us or get us lost in our own thoughts. It sounds stupid once I say it out loud. I had a great mentor remind me, Mackenzie, you wanna see answered prayers and you wanna have your faith build. Pray specific, get specific in your prayers. I know this, I know this. I've just been safe, praying safe. I'm reminding myself, I'm reminding you this morning to go for it. The power of life and death is in the tongue. We can prophesy and we can declare everything that happens here on heaven, here, I mean, happens in heaven, here on earth. We can do that. We gotta speak it out. We have to pray it. There is something he's put in you, only in you, you and you alone. He wants it to get out. We're gonna sing, but I just want you to bring the, the things that have been going on in here and in here. You bring them up to the Lord. We wanna partner with you, Jesus. by now they fall 
but you have never failed me waiting for change to come and knowing the battles won for you have never failed me still stands great is your faithfulness your faithfulness I'm still in your hands this is my confidence you never fail me yet You're still enough. Keep me within your love. My heart will sing your praise again. Your promise still stands. Great is your
confident in you, Jesus. We're confident in who you are, and what you've come to do, and what you are doing in us, to us, and through us. God, will you set us on fire? Will you let your dreams burn within us, Lord? Will you open our eyes and our hearts and our ears to hear and see you, Jesus? Will you spark the flame that's in us so that we can go and be the light so that your glory, your righteousness, your healing, your your amazing, awesome power, your goodness will flow out of us and through us and to us around into this world, into our neighbors that are uh, our, our friends, our family, just as we walk, as we worship, as we live. Let us not be content or take a safe play, Lord. But we would come in boldness because of who you are and what you've done. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you that you love us, that our confidence is in you, that you hold us in your hands, that we're safe there. We can make as many mistakes as you want, as we need. We love you, Lord. Move in us today. It's in your holy name we pray. Jesus Christ, amen. Good morning, friends. We want to welcome you uh, to the Wills Point campus. We also want to give a shout out to those that are joining us online. Uh, We're glad to have you this morning. Today, we're going to be wrapping up our series called Faithful. And uh, as I do so, I'm reminded by uh, the story of Jim and Elizabeth Elliott. Uh, The Elliots uh, met while they were at Wheaton College. Uh, Later, Jim uh, Elliott would have a heart and a desire to go to Ecuador and to reach the unreached people uh, that were native Indians in that region. Jim and a, a handful of others would go and they would begin the ministry there. Later, Elizabeth uh, would join them and they would be married uh, in a, a very small private ceremony and their mission in life would become to reach the unreached people groups in Ecuador. It was there and upon some of the success they had that Jim uh, had a desire to go further into the jungle to uh, a native Indian group that uh, had never heard the gospel and never uh, been approached with the gospel. Uh, initially, they uh, went and they took a plane across the region. They dropped gifts and goods, uh, developed a relationship, uh, eventually saw the success they were having in uh, that region, and they decided that they were going to go further in and begin to build a relationship with this Indian group, and that they were going to share the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. But it was there that they were met with opposition on January 8th of 1956. And Jim Elliott and his friends, Ed McCauley, Roger Yodirian, uh, Pete Fleming, and their pilot, Nate Saint, would go missing. Elizabeth, being a, a couple hours away, would hear it on the radio that these five men were missing. And she began to pray and anxiously await the news of her husband and the friends that had gone with him. Five days later, she was confirmed that those five men were viciously murdered in the jungle of Ecuador by a native group that did not appreciate their Christian values. Jim Elliott is a man that is known to have desired the uh, people of Ecuador to come to know Jesus. His most famous quote that he had logged uh, about seven years earlier in his journal uh, was a quote that just simply said, he is no fool to give up that which he cannot keep for that which he cannot ever lose. Uh, Jim knew that his life was dispensable and he knew that his life was to give glory to God and that if it cost him his life, that he was believing that Jesus was worthy of such a cause. At 28 years old, Jim uh, was not only uh, viciously killed, but their bodies were put into a river only to float downstream. 
He would leave at home a, a young wife who, uh, that they had only been married a couple of years, and they had a, a daughter that was around 10 months old. The question that you have to ask yourself, though, is what is young Elizabeth to do? Uh, what is it that she uh, desires in this moment? Her, uh, her life is now in, in ruins. Uh, she is in the middle of a place where there is no family. There is no one to comfort her or to mourn with her. Her husband and four of their friends are now uh, dead and they're gone. And she probably has to wonder some of the same things that many of us might. Is God good? And why would God allow such harm and suffering? And it is in those moments that if you were to ever have heard Elizabeth Elliot speak, she would have told you that it was in those deepest and those darkest places, the suffering and the angst and the agony, and the hardships and the trials of those moments that she grew closer to her heavenly father. She would write this 25 years later in 1981 in her book, Through the Gates of Splendor. This is her words. She said, God is God. I dethrone him in my heart if I demand that he act in ways that satisfy my idea of justice. It is the same spirit that taunted, if thou be the son of God, come down from the cross. There is unbelief. There is even rebellion in that attitude that says God has no right to do this to find men unless those men had long since given themselves without reservation to do the will of God. For us widows, the question as to why the men who had trusted God to be both shield and defender should be allowed to be speared to death was not one that I could, could be smoothly or finally answered in 1956, nor yet silenced in 1996. God did not answer Job's questions either. Job was living in a mystery, the mystery of the sovereign purpose of God. And the questions that orse out of the depths of that mystery were answered only by a deeper mystery, that of God himself. As we explore today, we want to ask the question, how do we be faithful in the midst of suffering? Peter, uh, as an apostle of Jesus Christ, he writes to a group of people who are running for their lives. And in 1 Peter, he acknowledges that there are uh, lots of people, Gentiles and, and most likely a handful of Jews alike, that are running for their lives at the hands of persecution uh, from the Roman emperor Nero and all of his schemes. These men and women would hide in caves and catacombs. They were suffering. They had hardship. They were being uh, ridiculed. There was no doubt that there would probably have been great numbers of death um, and um, ailments and anxiety. Uh, there would have been definitely a lack of peace at times. And yet Peter wrote to these scattered people, and he gives them a great hope. And he begins his letter to them with a handful of verses. And I want to show you 1 Peter chapter 3 through 7. And Peter wrote, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy. He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you who by God's power are being guarded through faith. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ." Peter writes to these people who had suffered similar to Jim Elliot and his friends. He writes to people who probably had the same angst and the anxiety and the emotions of an Elizabeth Elliot. People who were being persecuted and had real and genuine feelings, real questions to a holy and sovereign God. And here it is, Peter just reminds them, he goes, you have to remember that you have been born into a new and a living hope, a, a way that is imperishable. The idea of imperishable means that it's, it's not going away, it is kept, it is secure. The idea of undefiled means that it's unpolluted and unstained. 
And the reality is, as Peter says, listen, you have a hope that is imperishable, undefiled, and it's also unfading. It means that it will not be lost, it will not decay, and it is being kept in heaven for you. What he's telling the people is simply this, is that even though you and I face trials of many kinds, hey, we are going to persevere. And the reason why is because there is hope in the end. It is God's power who guards uh, the people. It is God's uh, power that gives the perseverance and the faith. It is this that he would encourage them in verse 6. Though you uh, suffer a little while, hey, you should rejoice. Rejoice because even though there are various trials, it is testing the genuineness of your faith. It is that that refines you in fire. It is that in which uh, takes away all the impurities and allows you to be all that God has for you to be. But it still begs the question that why is it that we live in a day and age where people experience hardship, pain, and persecution? I mean, really think about that question. Why is it that good things happen to bad people And bad things seem to always happen to good people. Why is it there's evil and suffering in the world? Why is it that God allows hijackers to board planes and fly them into buildings? Why is it that God allows infants to die before they take their first breath? Why is it that God allows parents to bury their children? Why is it that God allows evil men and drunk drivers to hit people head on in a collision that would kill what we would see to be really great people? Why is it that God would allow a paraplegic to lay in bed only to be rolled over time and time again by their caretakers day in and day out so they don't develop bed sores? Why is that God allows people to be born sometimes with defects or challenges that could impair their lives forever? Why is it that God allows some of the things that he does? After all, if God is loving, then why does he allow evil? And after all, if he's so powerful, why hasn't he done something about it? All of these are great questions, questions in which we oftentimes have to wrestle with. But today, I want to give you just a little bit of a hope and evidence as to why you and I should heed the words of Peter, heed the words of Paul and Jesus and many others who would encourage us to persevere in the midst of our suffering. And the reason why I want to encourage you to do that today is because that is what faithful men and faithful women do. God is good. And he does allow, as Matthew 5, the Sermon on the Mount would say, that he does allow the rain to fall on the just and the unjust. The evil farmer right now gets rain just as much as the good farmer, and sometimes even more than the good farmer. But as we start to understand why it is that God allows suffering, I, I think there's, a, there's about five things I want you to take note of, and one of them is really the bedrock of it all. And the number one thing that you and I have to understand, if we're going to understand the goodness of God and also suffering of the world, is that all suffering is a result of sin. Now, I want to be very clear that if what you just heard is, I'm suffering today because I sinned, that's not what I said. But what I want you to realize is that all suffering is a product or a result of fallen mankind. It is a result of what happened in the Garden of Eden in Genesis 3. It's the result of a crafty and a cunning serpent who deceived Adam and Eve and led to sin and the relationship with humanity and God being broken. It is the very thing that trans, uh, transpired in Genesis chapter 3 that actually led to the pain and the result of confusion in our life. It is the very thing that oftentimes even leads us astray um, to our own sin, which then also can create confusion and chaos and at times can bring about our own suffering. But what I want you to see is that it happened a long, long ago. Matter of fact, that's what Paul writes about in Romans. And in chapter 6, verse 20 through 23, this is what Paul says. He speaks to Roman believers and he says, For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness, meaning you did what you wanted to in your flesh. 
But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. What he's saying is, he goes, a result of our life apart from God in our flesh is death. It all brings destruction and pain and enmity. Uh, We might ask the question, what is it that causes fights and quarrels among us? James, the half-brother of Jesus in chapter 4, he would just tell you that it is our selfishness. It is our self-seeking. It is our sinfulness that, that brings about destruction. That's why Paul goes on and he says this in verse 22, but now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and it's it, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life and Christ Jesus our Lord. And he gives you two contrasting views. He says, in this life, you are going to have pain and destruction and it is all a product of sin. The heart of men are deceitful and they're wicked and they bring about pain and destruction. And all of that began with our ancestors, Adam and Eve. And he goes, and when you are slaves to your own flesh, as opposed to slaves of righteousness, he goes, you're going to do things that lead to death and pain and destruction. You're going to do things that isolate you and bring about uh, destruction and darkness. And he goes, and that's what the world is full of, is people who are experiencing the pain of and the consequences of Genesis, Genesis 3 type decision. Matter of fact, in Genesis chapter 3, it is there that Adam and Eve were moved uh, out of the presence of God. It was there that they were told that um, there would now be childbearing pain, that there would now be um, a striving and a contention between a woman and a man, that marriage was going to be difficult that the days were going to be long and labor was going to be laborious. Not only the childbearing labor, but the physical labor of a toiling after one's own work. That there were going to be thorns and thistles and that uh, to now uh, make your way among the world. It was going to be difficult. And more than that, there was going to be death. Not just a separation from God and removal from his presence, though that was true and actual, but also that that life would now come to an end. It was a reminder of our mortality. It was a reminder that our life was fleeting, that it's but a mist and a vapor, that it comes and it goes. And as we would see in Genesis, uh, we would also know that we came from dust and now to dust we're going to return. All of this, all of the pain, all the suffering, all the hurt, all the angst, all the anxiousness, all the frustration is the result of mankind's disobedience to God. And when we can begin to wrap our heads around Adam and Eve's disobedience and all the pain and the destruction that flows downhill as a result of their choices, we can then settle on this one truth that all we ever deserve from God is death. Like that's all we deserve, friends. And that is a very painful truth. But when we begin to arrive at that truth, knowing that there was a just and a holy God who created us for a relationship with him, But in our ancestors' choice, they broke the relationship and did what was right in their own eyes. It broke fellowship with God, created pain and destruction and confusion. And the only result that should have come from that is death and separation. And that result spirals downhill. And friends, that is true for every single one of us today. The only thing we really ever deserve in life is death, separation, pain, confusion, a life of darkness and distortion. That's what we deserve. But aren't we so thankful for Paul's words in Romans 6, 23, that the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life and Christ Jesus our Lord. That there is actually good news there, that even though uh, our lives are broken and unmanageable and though we have pain and destruction and confusion, that there is hope that it will turn and follow Christ, that our suffering can be limited. Not avoided, but limited. And the reason I say limited is because in this life, we are going to have pain. We are going to have tribulation. And all of us, in many ways, are going to experience it at different levels. There are many of you that have suffered far more than I have. There are many of you that have experienced things in your life that are incredibly difficult. 
there are many of you that are you're walking through um, a diagnosis even today that just reminds you of the fallen world we live in. Because disease and sickness all is a result of the fallen world we live in. There are things that have occurred in our lives and in your life that are somewhat um, heinous and unexplainable. And yet in all of these things, the reality is, is that God is still desiring to do something in our suffering. And if we can acknowledge and understand that our suffering is a result of the sin problem in which we live in in this fallen world, we can begin to see how God can reconcile even the sin and suffering we have been a part of to a good and generous and faithful God. And here's why. Because our suffering can actually be used as a statement of our faith. When Jesus had crowds accompanying him in Luke chapter 14, they were following him. It says this in verses 25 through 27. Now great crowds accompanied him, and he turned and he said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Now, if you think about what Jesus is saying here, he is essentially saying, if you are not willing to embrace suffering, if you're not willing to have hardship and persecution, if you're not willing to walk through dark and perilous times, if you're not willing to experience, even as David, the psalmist said in Psalm 23, though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we will fear no evil. For thy rod and thy staff, they bring us comfort. If you're not willing to experience that, he says, you cannot be my disciple. That's why Paul writes to his uh, son in the faith, Timothy. And in uh, 2 Timothy 3, verse 12, he says, Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. What Jesus is saying And what Paul is saying are simply these things, that not only do we live in a life filled with pain and hurt and persecution, but if you're going to have a statement of faith that you are actually a Christ follower, you will experience hurt, pain, suffering, and even persecution for the sake of Christ. Yes, there will be relationships that are broken. There are going to be striving and enmity even between relationships with children and their fathers and children with their siblings. There is going to be hardship in this life. And the reality is because our suffering is a result of sin. And the challenge with all of this is that all of our suffering is a statement of our faith, that we realize and acknowledge that we deserve death, but because of a a great foundation, and because of the hope that we have in Christ Jesus and the gift that he offers to us when we believe in his death, his burial, and his resurrection, that we too can identify with him in his death. And when we identify with him in his death, we realize that our suffering makes us like Christ. It is our suffering that allows us to be a statement of faith in a world who does not understand suffering. That's why I love the story of Jim and Elizabeth Elliot. That's the reason that I'm captivated by martyrs like them. And the reason why is because these martyrs are a demonstration of what Christ meant and what really causes the gospel to explode. Our suffering is a statement of our faith. But it doesn't stop there. Suffering also produces a dependence upon God's strength. See, I think oftentimes we view suffering in the wrong way. When we have hardships and trials and persecutions, I think oftentimes we see it as an affliction to us. Maybe even sometimes within the local church, uh, we can uh, kind of be like Job's friends and we can make some things out of uh, thin, air, thin air and we can make accusations about people. Perhaps we could even be like the disciples in John chapter 9 who saw a man who was born blind. And they asked their master, they said, Rabbi, hey, why is it that this young man is, uh, is born blind? Is it because of his sin or his parents' sin? And I love what Jesus says. He says it's neither, but it is so that the glory of God might be revealed in him. Sometimes our suffering is a statement of faith, but more than anything, our suffering should always require us to have a dependence upon God's strength. 
It is in our suffering, in our weakness, in our moments of despair, the darkness, the isolation, the times where we are confused and uh, we are sometimes clouded in our mind that we should actually run and turn to our Savior. That's why Paul reminds the church of Corinth about some of the afflictions and some of the experience that he had in, in Asia. This is what he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. He says, For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. If you have your Bibles and you're able to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and, and you're able to get there, it, I just want you to underline or circle affliction. Because the reality is, he goes, I don't want you to be confused or unaware of the things we've been experiencing. The affliction, the hurt, the pain that we experienced in Asia. For we so utterly were burned beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises from the dead. What Paul is saying here is so incredibly important. He says, listen, we were despaired to the point of death. And we know that Paul was beaten with a cat of nine tails five different times. Uh, we can account stories of Acts chapter 16 where Paul and Silas were beaten and unjustly thrown into jail only to sing praise of the Lord and to break out over an earthquake. The reality, though, is that Paul's dependence upon the Lord's strength that helped him to prevail in his times of suffering. The obstacles that he faced were simply there, and he says clearly, to make us rely not on ourselves, not on our own, our own power, not on our own strength, but on God, the one who raises people from the dead. Friends, that oftentimes is the mark of suffering in our lives, is it to bring us an awareness of the God of all comfort. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 just reminds us that God is the God of all comfort. He is the one who meets our needs, who comforts us, as the Apostle Paul says, in all of our afflictions. So when we are afflicted, when we are persecuted, when we are perplexed, when we're struck down, we are to note that even though those things are happening, we are not destroyed and we are not abandoned because God is with us and he desires to be our strength. And it is in those moments that we realize that we, although are weak, know that Christ is strong. Isn't that what Paul even reminds us of in 2 Corinthians chapter 12? In verses 8 through 10, he just reminds us that he had a thorn in his flesh. He would call it an affliction. Um, in essence, he goes, I've suffered. And he said, I have pleaded with the Lord three times, remove this from me. But the Lord wouldn't. And the reason the Lord wouldn't, Paul tells us in verse 10, is simply because he was growing him into maturity. He was developing him into character. And more than that, in Paul's weakness, God wanted to reveal his strength. I think oftentimes we've heard it said, God will never give us more than we can handle. But friends, can I just tell you that is not true? God will give you more than you can handle. God will give you things oftentimes in your life or he will allow things to happen in your life. Sometimes not even God given, but just allowing those to happen in your life. And he'll do it to bring you to a place of frailty, a place where you're weak and where you're downtrodden and you're in despair. And listen, when people try to comfort you with these words that he will not give you more than you can handle, listen, that is not true. It is not gospel oriented. But what I will tell you is this, he will never, ever, ever give you more than he can handle. But oftentimes God allows suffering in our lives to produce a great dependence upon him. And so as we think about a producing a dependence upon God's strength, it also reminds us that he allows suffering to produce sanctification in the life of the believer. Now, sanctification is a really big uh, churchy word, and that churchy word, sanctification, literally just means to grow up. It's the idea of becoming mature. Um, 
I'm 40 years old and I still struggle with maturity. Um, my wife often uh, wonders why it is I allow our kids to do certain things or why I teach them certain things. And she feels like she's raising four kids instead of three. And I would grant you that that's probably true. But the idea of sanctification is that one day you finally grow up. You finally begin uh, to move forward in your faith. And oftentimes it is suffering that allows a believer to finally move forward in their faith. It is suffering that produces such a rich dependence upon God that they are forced to move towards Christ. That's why James, uh, Jesus' half-brother, says this in James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. He says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that, so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Do you see what he says? James, the half-brother of Jesus, goes, it's, it's trials. It's the testing of your faith. That's what develops you. It's what brings about perseverance. It's what brings about your maturity, and it's the fact that you are being moved forward in completion. It's what God is using to bring about your growth so that you lack nothing. In Psalm 119, it says this in verse 71, And it was good for me to be afflicted so that I might learn your decrees. It is affliction that oftentimes teaches us how to grow up and to mature in Christ. And last but not least, and certainly um, not all-encompassing, but the fifth thing I'd like to share is that suffering brings a desire for eternal satisfaction. Friends, if there was no pain and hurt in this world, why would we long for a world to come? Guys, if we didn't experience death, then why would we long for a heavenly healing? If we didn't experience pain and destruction, why would we have a, a, a future hope and a glory that's unfading, undefiled, and kept in heaven for us? See, the reality is, is the truth of this present day is what in, in many ways should excite us for a future hope, a promise that is kept for us. It is what reminds us, as Paul says to the church of Philippian, of Philippi, to the Philippians, he would say, our citizenship is in heaven. And friends, it is that truth that allows us to hear the words that Paul writes to the church of Corinth in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16 to 18. He says this in verse 16, so we do not lose heart. Amen. Praise the Lord. We don't give up. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction, light momentary affliction. The death of a man who is speared by Ecuadorian Indians, by a woman who is now at home with a young child and no father. It is this light and momentary affliction. It is the pain that we experience that reminds us that it is light, that it is momentary and that God is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Friends, we trust that our suffering is producing us in a desire for what awaits us as an eternal satisfaction. Paul writes to the church of Philippi in chapter 3, verses 8 through 11. He says, I Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count them as rubbish in order that I might gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes from faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, and I may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I might attain the resurrection from the dead. Paul has a future hope. That's why we heed the words of Jesus in John chapter 16, verse 33, who says this clearly. I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. 
you will suffer. You will have anxiousness. You will have anxiety. You will have darkness. You will have despair. You will have death. You will have disease and sickness. You will have pain that is so deep and wounds so wide. But take heart because I have overcome the world. And friends, if we heed the words of some of the former martyrs, we would know that it is in our deepest pain that we can grow deeper still in our affection and our love for our Savior. And the reason why is because Paul tells us, even in Romans chapter 8, that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the future glory that is going to be revealed in us. Friends, God allows suffering and hurt and pain in this world to bring him glory and to produce good in our lives. Though oftentimes we cannot diagnose it in the most uh, micro sense. We can't diagnose it in every single person. We can't clearly see all that God is doing. I pray that these five truths would produce in you some hope and some clarity as to why faithful men suffer well for the glory of God. And I want to close with this. Fanny Crosby, a woman who uh, developed a, an infection uh, when she was a couple of months old. Uh, her parents took um, them to a fraudulent doctor, a guy who was practicing uh, doctor malpractice. Um, he gave her um, uh, some a prescription for her eyes would eventually lead her to being blind. Uh, this woman would grow up. Her dad would die by the time she was uh, the age of one. She uh, would have a mother who had to go to work and a grandmother who would raise her. Fanny Crosby was a woman of great devotion to the Lord, and God would use her to compose over 8,000 hymns. Among those hymns, you would hear ones that you might remember, like, Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Pass me not, O gentle Savior. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock. This woman is the one who penned these words. Perhaps the words that are most famous in all of her suffering, she penned as her first words when she was eight years old. And I want to close with them today. Oh, what a happy soul I am. Although I cannot see, I am resolved that in this world, contented I will be. How many blessings I enjoy that other people don't. To weep and to sigh because I'm blind, I cannot and I won't. Friends, in our suffering, we have a choice. Do we trust God? Do we grow close to him? Or do we push him away and do what our ancestors did? Do we do what's right in our own eyes? Friends, I would caution you against that. But may you draw near to your Savior, our blessed assurance. Let me pray for us. Father in heaven, I thank you for the hope that is being revealed in us through your word. Father, I thank you, Lord, for the stories of Jim and Elizabeth Elliot for Fanny Crosby, for Ed McCauley, for Roger Yodirian, for Pete Fleming and Nate Saint, and the millions of others who are not named and are represented in Revelation, the saints that are crying out for Jesus to avenge them. Father, I pray that until the day in which Jesus comes and reconciles all the indifferences in the world, I pray that you would help us to be a living hope, that we would proclaim our inheritance as saints in a fallen world, that we would hold on to that which is imperishable and undefiled and undefading that's being kept in heaven for us. Though we've been tested by fire, I pray that the result of our faith would be more precious than any ruby or gold or anything else offered in the world, that when burned up in fire, that we still stand strong. And so God, would you grow us in our faith would you help us to live for you? Would you help us to produce a strength that only comes from you? And would you help us to set our eyes upon you and the etern eternal joy and satisfaction you offer us? We love you and we thank you for your faithfulness and the example of what faithful men and women should be. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. On that word, will you stand and sing with this? Faith.
rise up, O oh heart, believe, let faith rise up in me. Let faith rise up, O oh heart. Thank you.